Hello, this is Dr. Lori. Welcome to this second video discussing the different types of um, cohort studies that we um, can uh, use in epidemiology. So in our first video, we talked a lot about this, um, this whole notion that we just start with a population and draw a random sample from that. In this video, I'd like to talk about a different kind of study, and this one works a lot of the same way ways, except um, the thing that I hope you notice that's different about the two often is the timing and how that initial group was um, recruited. So in this example, I'm going to be talking about starting off with um, two different groups. And the reason that we might do this is that we may have some kind of a rare exposure to a risk factor and it might be challenging if I were just to take a random sample to get enough people in my study that had that particular exposure. A couple of different examples that I have is um, we know that um, previously before we knew about x-ray exposure, um, some of the dangers of that, it was it became common for um, women to have an x-ray while they were pregnant to uh, check and see how big the pelvic outlet was maybe other things that were related to the pregnancy and this exposed that fetus to a large amount of um, radiation and so we have a specific exposed group in that particular case um, this is the, the, the babies or children who at some point in the past had been exposed in utero to x-rays. And then um, we'd like to see if that exposure somehow led um, forward in time to certain outcomes. The specific one that they were interested in was cancer. Um, and what they were noticing is that during childhood or early adolescence that um, they were having more than what they would consider to be normal for the number of childhood cancers that were occurring. Um, kids tend to be pretty healthy on average, and so here we were having all of these cases of childhood cancer, childhood and adolescent cancer, that, um, and we thought, hmm, well, maybe we can see if there was some difference in, um, in that exposure to radiation. So. Um, we went back in time and we found a group who had all been exposed to radiation during their um, early development. And then we found a similar group, um, same roughly age ranges, um, who just simply their moms hadn't had or needed or um, been near enough to a healthcare center to have those um, prenatal x-rays. And so we have these two groups and we've assembled them based on whether they were exposed or not. And so that's really a key factor to this type of a study. So we assemble everybody who's been exposed into a group and, every, and a comparison not exposed group. And you'd be surprised how tricky it is to actually find that comparison not exposed group we you know we think oh we'll just gather a bunch of people well what if that person had um actually been exposed and so we have to have similar methods of finding that not exposed group not just kind of randomly picking people who didn't end up being in our exposed group selected group um, so then we follow them, quotes, follow them forward and evaluate whether each individual in both of those groups developed this outcome that we're interested in, this childhood cancer. And um, the, the key thing to remember, and again, I'll draw this whole time, time scale on here, is that if I were to draw kind of time, time goes this way. The, the thing to keep in mind is that this is now, 
and we're noticing this this thing with childhood cancers we can't quite put our finger on it but we go back in time and assemble these two groups we go we go back to either previous records um, from the hospital or clinic um, and we find these two comparable groups that on all other um, features would be considered to be similar. They were uh, pregnant during the same period of time in history. They were uh, maybe perhaps in, delivered in the same hospitals, um, that kind of thing. So we go back in time and we form these two groups, the exposed group and the not exposed group. And then we kind of theoretically fast forward to now and we look at each person in that group to evaluate whether they have developed this outcome of interest. And so because we start here and go back in time, this is called a retrospective cohort study. Now, one thing that I like to remind people is that retrospective studies can also be of a kind of larger group uh, prospective studies can try to capture an exposed group and a not exposed group but what I've shown you is two of the most common ways that these are used um, so it's not um, they're not mutually exclusive and always this way but in my mind it's a good way to remember um, retrospective and prospective because of the way they're designed and some of the goals they're trying to achieve um, so here we have our two different kinds of cohorts. Again, we're observing. We are observing whether they were exposed or not exposed. This is in contrast with experimental where the, that exposure is assigned to a specific person or group of people. So we're just simply observing what the exposure was that happened and then um, following them forward in time and then seeing if that particular outcome has occurred. So that is a summary of this study design um, that can be very useful for rare exposures. Um, if we were to just go back in time and find random people, we may not find, find them specifically. So let me give you one more example of this study design for rare exposures. Um, this, can, this can often be used for um, exposures to um, environmental hazards such as um, Chernobyl. Um, we kind of have this automatic group that we're following forward and seeing what kinds of things happen. Could be, could be cancer, could be multiple different kinds of outcomes that we're looking at. Um, another common one that is reported in epidemiology textbooks has to do with the radium dial painters. And so this was a, this was a group of people who were selected because they had a very steady hand and they could paint that um, radium onto the dial of watches. Well, what we found over years and decades was that um, this particular group, often women, um, because they had a very small steady hand, tended to get cancers around the mouth area. And if you were to observe radium dial painters when they were actually painting the radium onto the dial of the watch, what they would do is they would take their brush, they would um, put the brush between their lips to make it very pointy, like a paintbrush, and then they would dip it in the radium, and then they would paint onto the, onto the dial of the watch so that it would glow. Um, well, that process of dipping in the radium and then touching it to their mouth exposed their mouth to that radium um, poison, basically. And so they ended up having a lot of cancers in that area. Um, around their their mouth and so we, what we did is we went back and we collected records from the workplace to find out who was it that was working and then tried to go forward and locate those people and see what had happened with them in terms of the outcomes the different outcomes that they could have possibly happened um, we also located a similar group from the same town that was not exposed. Now, finding this similar group can be actually quite tricky um, because what we want to find is a group that's the same on everything else, 
but this, they happened to not be exposed. So that can be more challenging than you'd think. And we followed that group forward um, and tried to locate them and to see if they had had specific outcomes occur. So those are a couple of different examples of these rare exposures that can be studied by these retrospective observational cohort studies. Thank you for joining me.